we're talking about. Get my mouse in the right place. There we go. Okay, so today we're talking about coaching agile delivery. Um, what I hope you take away from this talk is some ideas of how to work with teams and help get them focused on how they can deliver software. Um, we're going to look at how delivery is, uh, why it's important to Agile, and then go through some aspects. Uh, I think I've got like six points I want to touch on related to um, delivery. And then also think about how those, um, and then some questions to ask. So some ways that if you're working with teams, you can ask questions that will help lead to more of a focus on, uh, or a good focus on, how you can actually deliver Agile software. Okay, so uh, this is interesting. Most people learn to type on a typewriter um, of the people that are interested, at least of the people that are interested in coaching Agile delivery, um, and then spread across on some of the other, other computers here. I was just, was just curious about that today. Here's what we've got coming up. Today we're talking about coaching Agile delivery. On the 17th, we're going to be talking, uh, taking another deep dive into Agile principle number six, so face-to-face -face communication. On the 28th, of June, uh, Burr Sutter is going to join us to show um, what Kubernetes can do. Uh, Kubernetes is a way of enabling microservices, running a bunch of uh, orchestrated containers. Um, that sounds really, really technical, but in the past, the reason I asked Burr to, um, to join us is he's done a really, really good job of giving a good overview of here's what this technology does. So even if you're not necessarily technical, you're not a developer or something, you can have a good big overall picture of what is possible and some of the trade-offs with it. Some of the trade-offs of here's where microservices might be useful to you, here's where it's not, here's the tools. Um, so it could be a really good chance to kind of um, increase your vocabulary if some of the tools are out there and see how they work. He does, um, uh, he's all in on excitement. Um, so I asked him to give a talk and he's like, well, I like doing exciting things. I'm going to do just a full on live demo um, with fairly complicated stuff. So it should be pretty interesting. I encourage you to come, come to that. Um, and then on the 5th of July, uh, Julia Wester is going to be joining us to talk about um, forecasting. So what are the odds and talking about what are the chances that thing will be done. And it, it's, a really, it's a really good approach to thinking about um, not just kind of guessing how long things will take, but using your past uh, experience to say, here's what we think the probability is of being done by this date or this date. And if we need to have X number of things done before we do the next project, let's make sure we're not doing something that we've only got 5% chance of, of actually hitting that. So this is going to be an interesting talk, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, when, um, who was it? Uh, when we talked about um, con, pro Kanban, um, one of the articles that they mentioned I sent out to you, that was actually by Julia Wester, was the person that wrote that article. So um, looking forward to having her, her with us in July. And we've got other talks coming in there, but those are the ones that I've pinned down so far. Okay, so question for you. How many Agile principles mention delivery? Um, even if it's a little bit indirect, how many principles mention delivery? Get my, uh, put this in here again. So I see we've still got some chats about uh, uh, typewriters. And my, um, when my dad was late high school, getting ready for college, he, um, so that would have been like 19, in, in, the, in the 60s, I guess. Anyway, he said that the typewriter um, salesman came by their house to show them the typewriters. And he uh, set it out there and let people, or, you know, was mainly talking to my grandma, showing her how it worked and stuff, because uh, according to my dad at the time, most men did not know how to type. And so he kind of was addressing everything to, to my grandma. But my grandpa did know how to type. And he was like, well, here, no, I want to use it. Had to kind of shift the conversation because he, he knew how to type and he wanted to see how it worked. And then they eventually bought the typewriter. I think he still has it at home. I remember growing up uh, playing with it a little bit, um, probably doing horrible things to the keys, hitting them all at once. Okay, um, how many Agile principles mentioned delivery? So we've got two, four, six, eight. Depends a little bit on how, um, there's not a right answer here. It will mostly depend on how uh, wide of range you want to say, me or um, how generous you want to be and what it means to mention delivery. But what I want us to look at as we go through these is whether or not we're approaching the way we deliver software as an agile antelope or as a waterfall walrus. 
Um, so on one hand, are we actually using the Agile principles to push us toward being more Agile? Or on the other hand, are we saying we're Agile, but we're still the waterfall walrus there? So here's the principles that I find uh, either directly or indirectly talk about delivery. So the first one here, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now it calls out the word um, delivery explicitly, but it's talking about how do we get software into the customer's hands. So interaction here, your customer has been when it comes to completely satisfied with your last five software deliveries, do you strongly agree with that or strongly disagree with that? So where does it fall? And this, we don't keep track of who says what, um, but this, I like this because it kind of gives us an idea of where people are, are following as it averages, averages out. And we're doing the last five software deliveries because the last one may not be indicative of how we're doing overall. So it looks like we're, um, Let's say we got 104 people on. We've got 27 people that look like are, are participating in stuff here. Um, the link should be in the chat, so I encourage you to do that. If somebody wants to copy and paste that in, that would, that would be great. Uh, but it looks like we're, we're averaging about 3.5 towards strong, strongly agree. Uh, but we've got a wide range. It doesn't look like anyone says they strongly disagree. So most of us are at least not completely dissatisfied with what, what they were given. But this is the type of thing that principal is, is focusing on, is, is we're delivering software to try to satisfy the, the customer. And I think if we focus on delivering without focusing on that we're trying to satisfy the customer, we're gonna miss the point. On the other hand, if we try to think that we can satisfy the customer without delivering software, we're also missing the point. Deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. So this is the second uh, Agile principle that I see as being related to deliver because it mentions the word deliver. And it's once again in how do we actually get stuff into the hands of the customer? How do we deliver software? So how frequently do we deliver new features to our customer? So for on your team, do you deliver every day or every year? So take that slider and drag it to wherever you think is appropriate. And there's not really a clear, um, clear measurement for, you know, I think you've only got five, five options. So is it closer to every year or closer to every day? Maybe right in the middle is going to be a few months. So it looks like we, we tend to skew, at least so far, a little bit more toward um, taking longer to, to deliver. These are not good or bad. These are where you happen to be at. There may be a reason that you can only deploy once a year or once every six months or something like that. That may be that may be really, really good and very frequent for the type of software you're doing. On the other hand, our Agile principles should say we should be trying to deliver more often and getting stuff into the customer's hands sooner um, so they can get value from it. Working software. Okay, third principle. So we were counting these up. We had two. This is the third one, I believe. Working software is the primary measure of progress. So this one doesn't mention delivery explicitly, but it does say that the soft, what, what we want to measure progress as is working software. Um, and if we have software that runs just fine on my machine, but no customer can use it, I would argue that's probably not a very good definition of working because it's not actually doing any work just sitting on my machine. So I would say to actually achieve this, to achieve working software in order to measure progress, you're going to have to actually deliver something. That's, that's inherent in the idea of actually getting software to, to do work. So that's the third one. Okay, fourth one, simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Now this one may be a little bit of a stretch, but when I hear this, I do think of delivery as well because the ability to decide not to build something and to build something else or to leave something out does imply that then we're doing something with it, right? We're not just saying we're going to build software and then just stop. If, if we cannot do some piece of work, then it means that we're able to deliver something. So like I said, this one might be, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I think it does kind of get to that idea of we are delivering software to the customer. Um, because if we don't do something, what does that let us do? Is it just, we're going to stop working? No, we're, we're going to maximize the amount of work not done so we can actually deliver something to the customer. Yes. Do only what needs to be done. X by that's the delivery of value. That's a, that's a great way to, to word it. That's great. Okay. 
So those were the four. So I came up with four principles. If you, depending on how you read it, like I said, the goal isn't to make you say, um, oh, it's exactly this number. What I want us to do, though, is think about the fact that delivery is inherent in a lot of the principles. There were four. I think there were four there. Um, there's probably more depending on how you want to look at it, but it's a very, very important part of the Agile principles. Okay, so here is a hypothetical situation. Let's say your team can either be in one of these two situations. The first situation is that they can run a build and get feedback that the application works in five minutes, but each person has to spend 10% of their time maintaining their CI CD pipeline, so the continuous integration. So you write code, you check it in, five minutes later, you get back the information saying, here's what, um, Here's whether it worked or not. We, we've run all the tests, everything worked. You got five, f that feedback in five minutes. But the team has to maintain all the infrastructure to do that themselves, and that takes them 10% of their time for each person. So each person is spending four hours in order to keep the pipeline working at a point that they can get this five-minute feedback. Um, so that's each person spends four, four hours. Now, anytime they do a build, they get the five-minute feedback, but they also spend four hours a week um, at various times of people maintaining this, keeping it working and things like that. The other situation is it takes 60 minutes to get the feedback from a build, but 0% of the time maintaining the CICD project uh, or the ability to do, do their build and, and delivery. And meaning somebody else is actually managing that, that for them. They don't have to touch it. There's another group managing it. The thing that kind of inspired me to start thinking about this was I was there's a project I'd worked on that the team had managed the CI/CD pro process them, themselves, and um, so there wasn't an external team providing this for them. They were they were managing it all like down to the server level on their own, and it took time. It took a, it was a huge investment for them. Later on, that project moved to a different set of developers, and those developers had made the comment that man, we wish we could give all this stuff of maintaining this uh, the CI/CD pipeline to someone else. I wish we didn't have to worry about that at all. Um, and I think they they made some efforts toward trying to do that. I think they still managed quite a bit of it. Um, but it, it was a very, it, when, when they made that comment, I thought that's interesting. So I went back to the first team that had done it and said, hey, how would you have felt if we were able to hand that off to someone else? Like to someone else who was maintaining all the CICD and the build and, and all, all those pieces of things. And after checking with several of them, they said that would be really nice, but we probably wouldn't have been able to deliver the application the way we did because having actually making that investment and us being able to tune it to exactly what we need, they said that was a very important part of us being able to deliver the the um, the application on time. And um, this was interesting to me because there was that kind of difference in opinion from the team that had built it and had seen the value with it and the team that was then kind of having it handed to them to, to work with that felt they would rather give it to someone else. So anyway, that, that conversation I had with some, some people some time ago. And so when we were thinking about delivery, I thought, well, what if we kind of sketch this, this out? Let's create these two scenarios. So these two things, five minutes feedback, but 10% of your time. Now I can tell you developers are not going to enjoy spending 10 minutes of their time trying to deal with continuous integration every single or week, spending four hours a week on it, every single person, four hours a week. Um, this looks a lot more attractive, but it's got slower feedback. So just think about your developers. Um, which would they, which would your team probably prefer if you had to choose one of those two things? The four hour pipeline work per week, um, but you get five minute builds or zero hours pipeline work per week, but you get 60 minute builds. And there's not a right or wrong answer here. We're going to look at kind of graph this out to show what the trade offs are in, in this. And so go ahead and vote, vote for what you feel, just your gut feeling. Like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. What I'm wanting us to do, though, is think in terms of what it actually enables our delivery. And depending on various factors, one of these might be better than the other. Um, and it's not like one is clearly better than the other. It depends on your situation. But if we go into one of these things, just assuming one is better without actually thinking about our situation, we might not end up in the best place for our particular team. Okay, let's see. Oops. And I'm looking here. Okay, there's some people that have joined that can't, it says can't actually chat in the meeting. I see we've got a lot more people on that are actually, oops, over here, uh, participating. 
if you um, if you go to minty.com, if for some reason you can't see the the link, go to minty.com and type in that number. Then you can participate in the chats or in the uh, polls and stuff. I encourage you to do that. I think it's a lot more uh, interesting when you get to actually participate with things. And it's more interesting to me because I put a lot of time in getting these working, and so you'll make me feel better. Okay, so here we're going to graph this out. Like I said, there's no right or wrong answer here. But here's we've got the number of hours, and there's a number of hours each person's going to spend on something. Um, we've got the number of builds per week. Excuse my, my writing here. I was going to do this live, but I couldn't switch back and forth between them, um, and probably would have been more sloppy. Here's the number of builds we're going to do per, per week. So let's go ahead and graph this first thing on here. Um, <clears throat> we start with four hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right here with that first situation where we were saying that they get the feedback in five minutes, they start with four hours. They're always, each person is going to spend four hours a week on waiting for, for the build. Um, then each thing they do incrementally, each build they do is five minutes. So as we go over here, I think this over here is 12. And that means we spent about an hour on, um, on wait, waiting for, for the build. So this line works about here, but it's pretty high. We start pretty high. We're spending four hours. We do one build each week and each person spends an hour for that one build that they do do each week. So that is a line. It's a pretty big investment. It doesn't have a high growth rate, but you know, there's this may be good or maybe bad depending on what you're, how often you're building. So now let's graph the other one. And this one starts here. We're going to spend an hour waiting for one build a week, two hours waiting for two builds a week, three hours waiting for three builds a week and on and on like, like this. So the amount under the graph, under these graph represents what the wait time is. Um, let's see here. Okay. Yes. So the point I want to make with this is if we're delivering very infrequently, the waiting for an hour probably makes perfect sense because this is a lot less time. I may wait an hour, but I'm only building things once a week. Well, that's fine. Now I didn't have to make this investment in maintaining my pipeline and it being something that the team does themselves. However, once we get to the point where we're, let's see, one, two, three, four, once we get to where we're doing four builds a week or so, uh, we start getting break in, break even. Once we get to five in this particular scenario, it might be more, more worthwhile for the team to actually maintain that themselves if they're able to get that much faster feedback by tuning it to do exactly what they what they want it to. And like I said, my, my point here isn't to say this is the situation you find yourself in. My point here is to say, make sure you think about what situation you actually find yourself in. Because when we're thinking about what it takes to actually deliver code all the way through into production and get it into the hands of the user, Things like this really, really matter. If I'm trying, if I'm needing to build, what would this be? Maybe 12 times a week, 15 times a week, or something like that, or even more. I'm now going to spend a huge amount of my development time just waiting on the build pipeline because it takes so long. And it might have been better to shift the way I was thinking about my investments um, to where I, I may be putting in more time for fewer builds, but a lot less time overall. And this type of thinking applies to everything when it comes to how we think about delivery. What are the things that are actually impeding your delivery? And depending on which aspect you think, it's really easy to look at one of these and say, this looks really, really good. If you're missing the whole picture, um, if you're missing the picture that you only do one build a week and you try to do this red line, you're going to be in a bad situation. If you're missing the picture that you actually try to do 12 builds a week and you try to do the greenish line, that's not going to be good either. You've got to make sure you're looking at the big picture of what it takes to deliver software. Okay, and that brings us to... The title of this talk, Coaching Delivery. So how do we think about coaching delivery for teams? How do we get teams thinking about not just how do I stay busy, but how do I do actually deliver software to the customer? So we've got six points we're going to go through. We're going to talk about them a little bit. Um, we've got some polls and stuff, get feedback as, as we go. But then we're also going to be leaving you at the end of each one with a set of questions um, that might be good prompts for your team to try to start thinking through, are there ways that we can actually improve our, our delivery? Okay, so start on the right. So this is this is the, the first thing, start on the right. And when I say start on the right, uh, we think of the board here, right? So on this board, um, all these different things have different, uh, different time to completion, right? I've got these things over here that are in testing. Um, this one's blocked, I should probably figure out why it's blocked. This one's ready to be worked on, but not done yet. These are the things that have the least amount or should have the least amount of effort before I can get value from them. If I can finish these, so starting on the right side of the board and move them to done, that's how I deliver stuff. I could go over here and start pulling things in from ready into requirements. 
I can't deliver that as soon as I can deliver this. So start on the right, meaning start with how can you actually deliver something? What's the thing that you can actually deliver soonest? Now, if I prioritize my uh, work correctly, the stuff that's over here, all the way over here in testing should have been the highest priority, right? I shouldn't have done this story right here if this story here it was higher, higher priority, at least when, when I started that. So starting on the right, when we talk about the board, I mentioned this a few weeks ago that uh, some of the things I've seen work really, really well for daily face-to-face -face meetings is start over here and get the team focused on how do we deliver things and then work your way across the board toward the things if there is capacity to pull more, more work in. But this doesn't just apply at the level of the daily face-to-face -face meeting. This idea of starting on the, uh, starting on the right um, can apply to a lot of other things as well. So starting by asking yourselves, how do I deliver value, whether it's at the, you know, at the program level or whoever, how do I actually get stuff into the customer's hands and let that drive the decisions you're making instead of starting way over here on the, point going away, way over here on the stuff that we can pull in more work instead of focusing on how do I actually deliver something of value sooner. So what can we finish? So it, that that's where start. That's what it means to start on the right is getting people focused on getting ourselves all focused on how do I actually deliver something that's valuable. Um, I was giving a talk around this and running a simulation with a team one or with the group one time, and my kids were there helping me with it. And afterwards, my my son mentioned. He said, "You know, Dad, I've got a an idea. Maybe we should like start with. You know, I'm doing pretty well in math. I'm a little bit ahead." Maybe I should go ahead and finish that, take it all the way through high school, graduate from math, and then come back and work through English. Um, and while I appreciated that he was listening to what I was saying, there are some times where things actually have to work, work together. In that case, if you got really, really good at math, but never learned the English to be able to um, articulate things in math when you had to write an essay about math, you may not be in the best position. But that was him processing and trying to think through, how do I go and try to finish something instead of pulling in more work? Um, how can we start earning a return on investment we've made so far? This is another piece of the question we should be asking ourselves. So starting on the right. So here's the, the list, list of, of questions I, I was mentioning. So starting on the right, are we focused on finishing what we have started? A team I'm working with currently, that's one of the questions we're trying to really ask ourselves to try to get more flow moving through the system is making sure if there's anything we can do to get something across the finished line, um, we work on that before we start pulling in, in more work. And it seems like a very subtle thing, but it's very easy to pull in more work. And an example, I'll show you in a minute of a project my company's been working on for an internal tool. Um, and it's, I'm, it's interesting experiencing this as the customer because it's really easy for me to try to shove more work into it rather than trying to start taking advantage of what I have. Uh, next question, if we get halfway through a sprint and everyone stops working, will we have completed the most important things? Now, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but that's a good question for yourself of, am I pulling stuff across or into, am I starting to work on stuff because it's the most important thing um, that I can deliver for the customer? Or is it because it's something that I really, really want or other thing, it's, it's, the, it's the cool thing, it's the new thing that we don't need to go live, but it's how we help justify um, doing the rewrite of the system. Uh, what is the inventory value of work that hasn't been delivered? So when you finish code and you get it ready and it hasn't been delivered there, it's like inventory sitting on shelves that isn't earning you any value. The way you get value from it is you deliver it to the customer. Uh, what is easier for your team? To start on a new story, or to finish the story all the way to production. So there's no right or wrong answer. This is just how, what your experience has been in your team. And teams find this different. I find, for me personally, it's really easy to start on a new story and not go ahead and finish stuff because it's always, well, this is done, I've got the next thing. But if I'm focused on the return on investment I get, I'll probably tend toward trying to make sure I finish, finish work. So this is, and this can be a good thing to ask your team, like say, which of these are easier? And if everybody says it's easier to start a new story, we probably should ask ourselves, is that fact that's easier maybe driving our behavior in a way that's not producing as much value as quickly as, as we could? Are we really delivering for the customer if this is what we're saying is, is easy for us? And it's not bad for people to be honest and say this is easier for us to do, but if it's driving behavior that's not letting us deliver for the customer, that might not be a good thing. 
Okay, next point, emphasize the definition of done. So question for you, does your team have a definition of done? So meaning, do you have something where it's either uh, formally written out or mostly informal that you say, these things need to happen before we can say something's done. And for a lot of teams, it, it's like, this is what has to be done before we will demo it to the customer or before we will uh, move it across the board in a way that will show that it's, it's completed. So we've got a lot of people that have a very explicit definition, a lot of people that have some type of definition, even if it's informal, and we've got some people that, that don't have a def definition. Um, and I guess most people in this, they may not have talked through it, but there is, there's probably some sense the team has of what it takes to, to finish stuff, to say that something's um, complete. The reason that having a definition of done is so important is that if we don't have a good way of say, making sure that we're that something's actually, if we don't have a good definition of done, it's very easy for there to be hidden work um, that sneaks into things. So a uh, question for you, what is the most important thing on your team's definition of done? So if you have a definition of done, or if you've got an informal one, or if there's just kind of a general understanding, what is that one most important thing that you, uh, from, from your perspective, that helps the team? So automated testing, you've got to have automated testing as part of your definition done. That's a great one. Uh, deliverable, it can actually give you given to the customer. The customer is satisfied. That's a good one. It meets the acceptance criteria, meets acceptance criteria. Um, yes, if you've got, if you're producing code and it, it works, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to, that's no good. Working software, that's great. So these are, none of these are correct or wrong or anything like that. This is, these are just the types of things that people have on their definition of, of, of done. The value of having these types of things is it helps make sure that you're not hiding work in ways. Um, if you've got something that you need to take to production and production requires that it meets these certain security requirements and you say it's done and then you go to try to deploy it to production and your security person says, hey, you can't do this. You haven't met these security requirements. Those would probably be good things to have in your definition of done. Now, the definition of done can evolve over time, right? Um, when you're starting on a brand new project and you don't even have a production environment, your definition of done might not include some things that it will have when you get to production. And we'll talk about the importance of getting to production here in, in just a minute. So these are all great definitions. Uh, I'll move on to the next next slide here. But there, like I said, there's not like that there's something that the important part of that is making sure that you're being um, intentional about what you're saying it means for something to be done. Because it's really, really easy to get into a, a situation where you're like, ah, this isn't really done, but we're going to go and say it's done and start getting all this hidden work that has to be done before you can actually deliver it. And this is particularly true if you're not in a situation where you can go to production yet. When you can actually go to production, it's usually easier to follow, have a definition of done because there are often... Um, change management things that will prevent you from going unless you have certain things done. But I have seen places that say they they agree that automated testing is good for them and they want to do it, but every story seems to get through without automated testing because they're not really enforcing that on themselves and saying this is what we're, we're not going to deliver this unless it actually has it. Okay, so questions to ask your team um, about emphasizing the definition of done. So asking your team, what does it mean to be done with something? Um, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be able to say there's no hidden work left in this, or there's as little hidden work as, as we possibly could have? How much work is left to do once we say we are done? So if we say that we're done with something and it's only been tested or run on a developer's computer and we say, okay, it's done, well, there's all kinds of work that's gonna to have to happen before it actually gets into production and gets to the, to the user. That's probably not a great, um, definition of done is just on the developer's machine because there's so much work left to be done. Is our definition of done growing as our capabilities grow? So this is where I was talking about going through different environments. If I can just get to my dev environment, I may have some things that it makes sense to leave off the definition of done, particularly if I'm working to get to that QA environment, which is then going to broaden my definition of done. A definition of done that I see people use that's been pretty useful is say, we've deployed this to the highest environment we have available. So if you don't have production yet, then it means whatever environment you do have, you've gotten all the way through the environments up to the highest environment that you have available. Um, and so that's, that's where this can kind of grow as you grow in your capabilities. Uh, deliver to production. 
So next point, delivering to production is a key part of um, coaching agile delivery is keeping your team focused on delivering to production. So here, this is you right here, right? This is production. This is your code. You, production, your code. You're delivering your code to production. Um, delivering your code to another environment that the user cannot actually use it in production is not the same thing, does not say, have the same level of making sure everything's done and or level of getting value from, from it. Uh, when did your team last deliver to production? So these are no, there's nothing right or wrong about any of those, these questions, but just asking when was the last time you delivered to production? Was it in the last week, last month? last quarter, last six months, or last year. And there's there's no way to compare across teams. If you're delivering the uh, software for the space station and you delivered last year, that might be very, very rapid. If you're delivering software that shows cat videos on the internet and you did it last week, this is probably a whole lot more effort than doing the, the cat video. So it depends on what you're delivering. But these are the types of things you want to ask your team is get the team thinking about when did we last deliver to production? Are we actually taking things all the way through to where we can get value from them? Uh, so an example of this, I am I am working on a new uh, site for the Agile Lunch and Learn, a way to kind of manage the events. I'm using Google uh, Groups right now to send out the invites and stuff. And, and it's, it's working well, but I'm trying to get some other capabilities that I can't do with my kind of cobbled together thing that is working and it's in production and it works well enough that 115 or 120 of you all showed up. So I'm getting value from it. Um, but we're, we're making on this new new making this new site and we were doing some development on it. And one of the things we tried doing early on, because I practice what I preach, right, is let's take this, get this deployed on the production server. Even if it's very, very minimal, um, there's not even a way to subscribe, but it's just going to list out the events. I'll show you an image of it later. List out the events that are com coming up. Um, getting from the point of having that working just locally and on a test server to the point that it was deployed in, uh, in our production server, there was a huge amount of hidden work that came up that weren't things we thought of. Um, I, maybe if we had to try to articulate all of them, we would come up with a lot of them, but we had to set up DNS, like actually come up with the URL for it. Um, we had to set up SSL because the way this server worked, it, it had SSL on it, but if you're using your own DNS, you had to get SSL set up for that DNS. Um, we had to get SMTP set up for sending mail. We had to figure out how to clear the, the cache on the system, which was something we hadn't even thought of yet. Um, and then we had to work through what the deployment issues were. Well, once we got that set up and all the way through to production, then we started whenever we'd make a change, we could move it through our different environments and get it to, to production. But the point I want to make with this is there was a lot of work around getting that to, to production that would have been hidden work if we didn't get to production sooner. So being able to actually get to your production environment sooner, even like this isn't live. I mean, you can go see it if you want to, but it's not up and being used for things other than I'm just starting to populate it with things and, and test it out. But it is in production. I've done all these things that I need to do in order to actually have it in production. So I'm trying it in a real environment that I'm going to actually use it as a live system, not just a test environment or not just a local machine. Okay, so questions to ask your team to help foster coaching toward delivering to production. You can ask, is it more valuable to take what we have in the next environment, have to the next environment or to create new features? So if you've got something deployed to your dev environment and you have a QA environment and maybe a prod environment, would it be more valuable to invest your time in getting that to the highest environment? Or should you turn around and just work on new features and not worry about getting that to the other environments? Um, usually, if you focus on this, you'll be able to lower your cycle time to where you'll get faster feedback and you're more willing to make an investment in automating the ability to move from environment to environment if you're actually going to do it every time. So that's a good question to ask. Um, and it also helps remove, like I was showing you, get rid of the, the hidden work that can be there. Do we have proof that the current features can be deployed to production or are we just hoping? Um, so this is a big one, right? Uh, we may have this deployed to our dev environment and think, okay, that's great. It's deployed in dev. We don't have to worry about this anymore. We can deploy it to production. Let's go work on some more features. But do you really, are you just hoping that dev looks enough like production that your deployment to dev will actually let you deploy to production. And oftentimes it's really easy to be hopeful about that, 
Um, but if you if it's important, you probably should prove it. Actually take it to production. And then what is our cycle time to get to production? How long does it take us from when we start working on something to get it all the way to production? Because that's going to become very important. If that time is too high, it will push us toward not actually taking things all the way through because it's expensive. It's, it's hard. Um, if we have that time really, really short, it's easier to say, hey, I made this very small change and I can take it all the way through to production where we can prove that it works and start getting value from it. Next point, deliver things that delight the customer. So I ran across this picture, and I, I think this is a good, my, what came, came to my mind when thinking of delighting the customer. We've got a little girl. She's got a present. She's about to opening, open it, and she's saying, please be a pony. This girl may be delighted with whatever's in the box, but it probably is not a pony in the box. But I could tell you, if you gave this girl a pony, she would be very, very delighted with what she was delivered. So delivering things that delight the customer. So questions to ask your team to help um, encourage a focus on delivering things that delight the customer. Does our customer have any idea about, have any idea what we are demonstrating to them? So this comes to the idea of delivering working software, but working software that actually does something to the for the customer. If we deliver our software in slices, then it should have stuff that has user facing things that the customer can actually experience it. Even if it means we had to build out some of the database and maybe the customer doesn't really understand how the database works, but they do understand how it works all together and what it provides them. Um, if you start delivering things across like this, like we're going to deliver a database to our customer, the customer may not have any idea other than a vague thing of what they're actually being given. This is where it can be very, very important to focus what you're demonstrating to the customer that you're delivering to them on things that actually have business value and business meaning to, to the customer. If the customer doesn't know what you're trying to say you're delivering into um, production for them, you may need to think about how you're slicing your work to make sure you can deliver things that actually delight the customer, even if it's a very, very thin, thin slice of something. Are we working in slices that have clear return on investment to our customers? So just refinement the same question. And how many things will the customer be able to do after this sprint that they couldn't do before? And if the answer is there's nothing they can do because we were just working on um, runway or stuff to get ready for what we're going to do later, um, if, if that happens sometimes, there, you may not have an option, but that doesn't let you deliver something that delights the customer. And you want to make sure you're getting to those slices all the way through so you can make sure you're delighting the customer. Measure progress correctly. So uh, there's a couple on um, Saturday Evening Post, um, some artwork from Saturday Evening Post that I thought kind of came to my mind when I thought of this. So here we've got somebody right here. Um, they're trying to measure, weigh something um, with, and I'm not sure if it's correct or if they cancel each other out, whatever it is. But they're not probably measuring progress or measuring the weight of things very well. And then this other picture over here um, where things are not being measured in the way that they, they seem. Uh, interestingly, this is not Norman uh, Rockwell. Uh, this is somebody else. I can't remember who the artist was. I thought it was a Rockwell painting when I was looking for it. But anyway, so these are examples of not measuring things very, very well. So how many of you have been on a project where you project this, right? We've got 100% completion of the project, and then we've got time. And so we have this idea that as time goes by, we will get closer and closer to 100% completion. And it's going to be kind of this linear growth like this. But then what ends up happening is something that looks more like this, right? It's like, oh, look at all this progress we're making. We're making great progress, great progress. And oh, it slows down. And oh, it turns out we need to deploy to production. And we've got security things we need to do. And we need to find a way for users to log in. And it, you know, this early idea that we might finish right here, this was deceiving us how much was actually done. So you want to make sure you're finding a good way to measure your progress that doesn't give you this misleading idea that you're making all this progress and then it flattens out because, I mean, I've seen some that come up and then actually go back down because they discover all the stuff that actually needs to be done. So we want to avoid situations that do this. We, we want a smooth line. Even if it's below this right here, we'd rather have a smooth line that actually shows how much progress we're making than a line that makes it look like we're doing really, really good, but it's not predict not good at predicting where we're going to, to be. Ideally, if you can get something that's really, really slow and starts going up like that, that's that's great. But a smooth line um, is what you want, not something that bends and makes you think you made a bunch of progress that you haven't actually made.
So think, think about this. When we're thinking about predictability, what are the chances that the last 10 stories you finished will have a week or more of hidden work? So the last 10 stories that you, whatever your definition of done is, you finished, are going to have a week or more of hidden work across all 10 stories. And this depends a lot on what your environment is, where you are in your, your application. But I, what I want you to do is just think about um, that and, and say, if there's like 90% or greater chance that the last 10 stories have a week or more of hidden work, what does that tell you about the predictability of how much work is done? Like, what does that tell you about where your, uh, tell you about how much of the project is actually done? And if it's really, really high, that probably means you don't have a lot of, you don't have a lot of confidence that you've done as much as you think you have. Like I said, no right answer, but these are things we, we should be thinking of. So measure progress correctly. Are we measuring technical steps as progress or working software that provides business capabilities? It's really easy to focus on technical steps of we created a database, we set up this, we set up the, um, the CICD server, whatever. And those things are very, very important. But if we're using those to say, and now we're 5% done with this project, that's probably not a good measure because it's not the actual software that provides business capabilities. All those things are there just to support the business capabilities. And if we can build some of that into each business capability we deliver, we're going to have progress measured in a better way that reflects where we actually are. Um, how much hidden work remains? If it is hidden, we probably don't know, right? So that's kind of a silly question, like how much stuff do you not know? Um, but the idea of just guessing based on the past of saying, you know, the last 10 stories that we did, here's how much it had a week of hidden work that might tell us something about how we need to do our work, but how much hidden work remains or how much is unknown about the work um, that we've done so far. Are we measuring code that we might be able to get to the customer as progress instead of code that we actually delivered? So in other words, are we saying that we've got progress because we created this code? Or are we saying we had progress because we gave it to the customer and they were happy with it and said it did what they wanted? Those two things, the idea that we might be able to deliver it someday is not the same measure of progress as saying we gave it to the customer and they're using it to do their jobs. Embrace iterative improvements. Um, so the idea of delivering something before you deliver everything, and that can be a very hard thing to do, but if we're focused on giving stuff to the customer, we should be very willing to give them part of what they want, and hopefully the most important part of what they want, before we give them everything that they possibly want. Um, and you've probably seen this example, the idea of a customer says, I need to, I need a car. You say, well, where do you need to go? Well, I need to go down to the end of the block. Okay, well, let me give you a skateboard and you can start exercising that, going back and forth. And then they say, how do you like the skateboard? Like, well, it works good, but I also need to go to school. Well, what can you use a skateboard to go to school? Well, the school's a little bit further and I'm not too stable. So for that long of a ride, I might fall off. Well, let's, let's turn it into this. We'll turn it into a scooter. Now you can go a little bit further. Uh, it's a little bit more stable, and now maybe they can go to school, which is a few blocks away. Well, how's that working for you? Well, this is great, but now I need to go to the store. I need to be able to carry stuff back with me. Well, what if we give you a bicycle? Okay, well, but I want a car, but can you get to the store with a bicycle? Okay, we'll rework things and give you the bicycle. Well, now I need to go 50 miles. Well, that bicycle might not work very well for that. What if we put a motor on the bicycle? Now you've got a motorcycle. Um, and these iteratively of giving them something to do. Now, we may come to here, and they may say, that goes everywhere I need. There's no sense investing in building a car. Or they may see, say, where's the next place you want to go? And they say, we want to go to Hawaii. Well, the car's not going to get them to Hawaii. That may be what they thought they needed, but as you actually try to solve the next iteration of what they need, you may find they need a boat or plane tickets or something like that. Or you may very well find that they do need a car. Now they need to drive hundreds of miles and take their whole family with them, and then you can grow it into to a car. But this idea of iteratively delivering things um, while it might not make sense if you were trying to bend metal and rubber, in software, this is a lot easier to do. And there's often resistance to this with the idea that there's going to be rework on some of these things to get from one thing to another, but we're dealing with code, not concrete and not physical materials. And the value of getting the feedback and getting it in front of customers is usually much, much greater than we give it credit for. Okay, and here's the uh, the example I was talking about. So this is the, the Lunch and Learn site that, that we're working on of trying to get this and actually iterate. And I know for me, my tendency was to, when we were working through developing this, was, okay, 
Um, yeah, it's easy to make a list just that shows the people that, that are coming up, but what I really want to do is deal with the way that we send out invitations. And I had to come back and say, no, I want to do this iteratively. Let's just get a list in a way that somebody could come to this page and get this added to their, their calendar. Um, the other stuff, we're going to build this other stuff into it, but first let's get to the point that we can deliver this particular thing. So we've been working toward that. It should go live here um, soon, and we can start using it in this small, small iteration. But I can tell you that from my perspective, this was really hard to do because my tendency was to try to take on more and more scope to solve all these other problems. Um, it was a good experience for me because I'm having to go back and say on my own stuff, I really have this tendency to try to do less iterative and I had to really work hard to make sure I was doing it in an iterative way. So embrace iterative improvements. Questions to ask, is any piece of this story more valuable than the others? Can we deliver that first? If half of the story is the most valuable thing, we'd be better served to get that delivered and into the customer's hand and then come back and deliver the less valuable part or reprioritize it. Maybe there's something else that's more valuable than the thing that you carved off. Are we prioritizing the magnitude of what's delivered over the frequency as what we deliver? So I'm better off delivering iterative improvements, which means I need to focus on the frequency of getting value through the system, not just how big of a thing can I shove through it. And could we get feedback on half of this ticket while we work on the second half? Uh, defer everything possible. So I'm going to skip through through this one. I'll just kind of ask the question. Um, if we defer stuff, it means that we are focusing on what not to do today, which means we can focus on something that it is not possible not to do today. So in this I've showed this slide before, and it kind of lines up with the, the skateboard mindset. But if I start out by working on, let's say I'm replacing the existing system, if I start off by creating new features, and I've got a new feature, and then here's something that I have to have to, to be able to deploy to production, then new feature, um, and then this is the thing I need to be viable as a system of record, I can do this sequence in a way where I don't defer anything, I do whatever I want to do, do next, but then I can't go live till I get over here to get the system to actually work, or I can do it in a way that lets me start off with getting to the point that I can demonstrate just the minimal rudimentary functionality. And then I get enough built, maybe I add security, and now I can get to production. And then I get enough built that I can actually switch to this and make it the system of record. So if you think about my uh, the event manager thing that I'm making, eventually I'll get to the point where I can start using it for that um, and sending out invitations from it. Right now, I'm kind of over in this, this part of it. And then I can take you know, eventually I'll get to the point where it achieves parity with what I have today, and then I can add new features to it. But if I take this approach down here, I can actually start using it, getting feedback, and getting return on it sooner. Where if I take this approach up here, I've got to wait till the very end before I can do anything with it. Um, so questions to ask on deferring everything possible. Everything we choose means not doing something else. So anything we choose to do today means we're not doing something else. What are we choosing not to do? Are those things more important to us? If I choose to do A today, it means I'm choosing not to do B. B might actually be more important to us in the big picture and in terms of return on investment. Now, the question to ask ourselves, will our future selves be happy with our sequencing? And is there any possible future where we could go live without this story? I particularly like this last question. Is there any possible future where we could go live without this story? Because if there is, we should do the things that we say, no, there's no possible future we could go live without this story. Do those things first. Don't ever prioritize something that you might, in some possible parallel universe, be able to go live without. Don't do those until the things that you could not possibly go live without are done. Okay, so in summary, sorry I went a little over time. This was a new talk, but a start on the right. Emphasize the definition of done, deliver to production, deliver things that delight the customer, measure progress correctly, embrace iterative improvements, and defer everything possible. So I will move to the this. Please go ahead and take the time to uh, fill out the feedback. Um, this is helpful to me because it's the first time I'm giving this talk and I'd like to hear what people thought. Sorry we did go over time. You can do that as you go. I am going to switch over um, and show if there's any questions and answers people had about this, and I'll stick around for a little while. Um, thank you so much for coming. Please do fill out the feedback form, though. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them on the tool, or I'd love to just, just come off mute, and I'd love to talk to you.
in a lot of situations, it seems like it might be hard to um, convince the customer that they should be satisfied with the, like, getting smaller pieces of the end product. Um, thoughts on this? So a situation where you, you've got a customer is this kind of like, go build it all and come talk to me when it's all done. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, I, I think, I, so I, I have experienced that. And I think some of it comes from people that are used to, if you're used to off the shelf pro software, like I want Microsoft Word. You don't go out and you don't build Word for them. They get Word and it's like, okay, I've got everything that I just asked for or what I think think I wanted. And if you're used to dealing with off-the-shelf software, the idea of custom building something is very different. If you think about like with a house, if you go to buy a house that's already made, it's not like you need to make a thousand decisions about it. But custom software, there are thousands of decisions you can make. And I think, so one of the things I tried to talk to, to people about is if, if you participate in this, in what we're doing here, we can get this to you a lot sooner and get them thinking in terms of the value it actually provides and how they can start getting a return on investment from it. Now, that's, that can be hard to do, but if you get them talking about the value it will give them, you can often get people thinking about how do I get this value sooner? Because if you can get them asking, how do I get this value sooner? Then they're more willing to say, well, give me this piece. This piece would save me. I've, I've got this job I do that's horrible and I hate doing it. I'm like, well, what if we replace that? Well, then people get really excited about it, right? Like, yeah, I'm going to have to do that this afternoon. If I didn't have to do that, I would be a much happier person. So having those conversations around the pain points and how you could make those go away by giving them a piece of it can be one way. But yes, it's hard, hard conversations to have. <laughs> Good question. Any other thoughts or comments? I have a question. Um, Mark, I've seen uh -huh. your video about the MVP with the, the scooter and the skateboard. I really love that video. Um, you did, uh, you had a different graphic up with those, I don't know what you'd call them, kind of the rectangles with the different colors based on what type of work it was. And you showed right. us you do all this different work layered in, you have to launch at the end versus in, you know, halfway through. I was just curious if you have any plans to do a YouTube video on that graphics. I really loved what you said about it. Oh, I, I probably should. Um, I'm behind on my YouTube video posting schedule. Uh, but that's a good idea. Thanks for thanks for the feedback. I, I will try to do something on on that. That's a that's a very good idea. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the new site. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Any other questions, concerns, or aggravations? And do do fill out the uh, the feedback form. I really appreciate that. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off. Sorry we went over my anticipated time. Great to see you, Cody. Um, see everybody later. Thank you.